Hubhopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. Our very eminent guest today is a paleontologist, evolutionary biologist and astrobiologist known for his study on fossils of the Burgess Shale and the Cambrian explosion. He is a professor of evolutionary paleobiology at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of more than 100 scientific articles and is also the author or editor of several books. These books include The Crucible of Creation, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe, and The Ruins of Evolution. He was elected to a fellow of the Royal Society at age 39 and has also been awarded the Walcott Medal of the National Academy of Sciences as well as the Lyell Medal of the Geological Society of London. In his new book From Extraterrestrials to Humans, he opposes the view that evolution is boundless in the kinds of biological systems it can produce. We have a very interesting conversation with him today where we cover topics like does evolution proceed blindly with no end game he suggests otherwise we also talk about mass extinctions and whether they steer the development of life in radically new directions we examine the popular tenet that the intelligence of humans and animals basically are the same thing a difference of degree not kind and as per him a closer scrutiny of our minds show that in reality there is a huge gulf that separates us from even the chimpanzees so begging questions of consciousness and mind we tackle the question of extraterrestrials and surely the size and scale of the universe suggests that alien life must exist somewhere beyond earth and if that is the case then where are they this is a very engrossing conversation So we ask you now to sit back and enjoy this journey through our conversation with none other than Dr. Simon Conway Morris. So Simon from everyone here in India and Indian genes it's a real pleasure to have you here. If you could give us a little bit of an introduction about what got you into doing what you are. Well thank you. Um I'm almost inclined to say that because we've only got 1 hour for the introduction I hardly know where to begin but um very very briefly I I knew that I wanted to study fossils from about the age of 7 or 8 and um the particular inspiration if that's the right word is that my mother bless her gave me a sort of book where you could tear out pictures of ancient animals a bit like a, a bit like postage stamps and stick them into the right box in this sort of album and for some reason this triggered my imagination and then of course a great deal of growing up happened and i didn't only work on fossils or look for fossils and ultimately um at a reasonably young age i found myself in the university of cambridge where i'm speaking from at the moment and i started to do a phd that's a doctorate program on very specific fossils very remarkable fossils um from canada uh, in fact from british columbia and these fossils are amazing not because they're old they are fairly old but on a geological time scale they're about half a billion years old so that's quite young for earth history but the fantastic thing about these fossils is that they included the soft bodied remains the soft tissues which almost never survive during the process of fossilization and we had a wonderful time um, many of the collections were at that point in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington DC and then subsequently I went on expeditions to many many other parts of the world um including China and also Mongolia and Greenland but the net result of these early studies was that I came to the conclusion that such was the diversity of fossils which we were looking at some of which were clearly related to living forms so for example we found a fossil which looks as if it might be might be a precursor of the fish from which we of course come as vertebrates but there were many other forms which looked utterly bizarre really strange almost alien and at that stage i thought well just supposing that that 
early fish had not survived and some other animal from this deposit, which incidentally is known as the Burgess Shale, did survive, then perhaps the history of life would have been completely different. And all of us can think about how the history of nations, India, of course, is as good an example as any, how things might have gone slightly differently. And that all developed very nicely, but then not immediately, but one day I changed my mind. And scientists are allowed to change their mind. They can be honestly wrong, or at least we can say they can be honestly reconsidering the evidence. And since that point, I began to become very interested in something called evolutionary convergence. So let me let me halt at that point because I've been speaking for a long time already. I think you've uh, halted at the right point. And if I can just uh, clarify once more or take one step back, when you mentioned about the Burgess shell, you also wrote a, ro- a lot about that in your, I think it was probably somewhere in the 1990, late 1990s, when in the crucible of creation, where you were exploring the phenomenon of evolutionary convergence, or did that come to you because of specifically your investigation into the Burgess shell? And it would be interesting for you to just tell us how that happened. Well, thank you. That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, the, the, the inspiration for what has been famously described as rerunning the tape of life, that is, if we were to start off again at the time of the Burgess Shale and let history run all over again, was um, driven by Stephen Jay Gould, who was a very eminent uh, paleobiologist and historian of science in Harvard University. And at the time when his book, Wonderful Life, was published, that was very much a thesis I would have agreed with. And uh, indeed, I think some of the ideas in Gould's book came from some of my work. But then a whole lot of things sort of changed. I mean, one of them was that actually some of the Burgess Shale animals did not turn out to be quite as weird, strange, exotic as was once thought. And oddly enough, another inspiration, if you like, is that Stephen Jay Gould, the thesis of Stephen Jay Gould, that were we to rerun the tape of life, we would end up with a biosphere today which would be uh, completely different from the one which we actually know about because the uh, history of life could go in many, many different directions. And there's no reason to think the history of life is uh, special in any particular sense, or is it? So um, what led to my change of mind was, I think, several things. One was that um, a number of the fossils in the Burgess Shale um, turned out to be more familiar than we realized. Um, and in fact, one was more familiar because I had made a crucial mistake. And that was I was working on an animal which I named Hallucigenia, sort of dreamlike animal. And um, it turned out that this animal was fairly accurately uh, reconstructed with one interesting exception. I got it upside down. Um, so that was not exactly a grand start to an academic career, was it? Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I could, if I had time, I could explain how I made that that now, in hindsight, simple mistake. But another aspect of it, ironically, was that Stephen Jay Gould himself was famous for writing books, but he also wrote many essays. And in one of them, or a set of essays collected in a volume called Bully for Rontosaurus, I happened to review that for the Times Literary Supplement, and this is many years ago. And in there, he had several essays which kept on touching on this phenomena of evolutionary convergence. And I think thereby, as I mentioned, ironically, this actually triggered my interest in the possibility that, in fact, evolution is not as um, open ended than has generally been thought to be the case by the great majority of Darwinians, but might actually be constrained. Now, to begin with, of course, there are obvious constraints. Like, for instance, there is what we call the viscosity of water or the viscosity of air. Moving through a fluid such as air or water imposes very, very strong physical constraints. In the air, we think of wings, for example. And correspondingly, and again, this argument developed in different sorts of ways, it turned out that what we call evolutionary convergence, and at this point, I will give you an example, if I might, and that is that um, the humans and 
the other backboned animals, the vertebrates, have an eye which is approximately based on a camera principle. If you go and look at the squid or the octopus, marine creatures, they too have a camera-like eye, which at first sight is almost indistinguishable from the eye which we possess. And yet we can show beyond reasonable doubt that although both are animals, their common ancestor did not possess such a complex eye. In other words, the camera eye has evolved independently, not actually twice, but probably seven times. And these examples of convergence kept on multiplying again and again and again. And in the end, I was hard pushed to do anything except, first of all, say evolutionary convergence is ubiquitous. But second of all, it's really difficult to find anything which is genuinely unique. So we return to Stephen Jay Gould's argument of rerunning the tape of life. And indeed, one can say that despite all the twists and turns of evolution, and the historical process. And that in parenthesis includes mass extinctions, which we might come on to in due course. Actually, the end point of any of those processes would end up with something really pretty similar to the world we see around us, including crucially people like ourselves, in other words, humans. Right. And we definitely will come back to the mass extinction uh, extinctions like you spoke about. And if we could just stay here for a minute as I just want to thrash this out a little bit more. How would you place first, if you could tell us, the Burgess shell? And then we can just move to why is the Cambrian explosion? To me, it's very exciting. And I just want to hear from you sure. what exactly is exciting about it. Uh, well, thank you again. Um the, the whole question of what we now refer to as the Cambrian explosion goes back to at least the time of Darwin. And if you look in his book, The Origin of Species, you'll find the best part of a chapter is devoted to the question of how come, when we look at the fossil record, we find as we go deeper and deeper into time, fossils, as we go deeper and deeper into time, by and large, they become less familiar. For example, in deep time, we find trilobites. However, if you go to rocks which are older than roughly 600 million years, which is very ancient on our time scale, but geologically is not so old, then, and here I simplify, the fossils disappear. You can find them, but they're mostly in the form of microbes, very small, often single-celled organisms. And Darwin was quite alarmed about this because Darwin felt that everything happened rather steadily and gradually. And that, in contrast, what we now call the Cambrian explosion, though that word explosion reflects this observation that basically, when you go to the fossil record, suddenly they start appearing. And I've been in uh, locations in Australia, for example, we're walking up one of these dry valleys in the outback. And of course, it's it's blazingly hot. And we're walking into what we call a Precambrian, and there's basically nothing. And then suddenly, we start looking at the rocks, and the fossils are there everywhere. Uh, so it now turns out that understanding the Cambrian explosion has advanced in many different sorts of ways. To begin with, it's clear that there are various sort of antecedents to the apparently abrupt appearance of the fossils. But on the other hand, there is very little doubt that there really is a sea change, so to speak, in the nature of the history of life. Complex animals with nervous systems do evolve relatively rapidly, not instantaneously, but even so, probably over an interval of perhaps 30 or 40 million years. Now, the problem with the fossil record is, understandably, by and large, only what we call the hard parts, the skeletons will survive and the soft parts will rot away because, as you will all know, um, soft parts will uh, often disappear in a few days. But there are these extraordinary deposits, one of which is the Burgess Shale. Another one is located in Greenland and even more are located in southwest China. And here the soft tissues are fabulously preserved. 
Not only are they preserved in animals with skeletons, which is not too surprising, but also and crucially, there are many of the animals preserved there which have no skeleton at all. So it's like having a window thrown open into a vanished world. Usually the paleontologists, the people who study the fossils, only have the skeletons. And it's now clear that so far as the Burgess Shale is concerned, only about 10% of the species actually would preserve in normal circumstances. So we have this incredible insight into this, this extraordinary richness of early animal life. And you just spoke some time back about the trilobites, and I wanted to check with you because I'm not sure whether the trilobites, were they the first fossils that appeared with skeletons or with, ex with an exoskeleton? And was there only one type of trilobite that survived, or there was a time when there were many and then one survived and probably moved on? Oh, <laughs> you, you've, you've asked a de deceptively difficult question. Um, the, uh, the, the, the evidence at the moment is that the trilobites are not the first animals to develop skeletons. Um, but more importantly, it's clear that the trilobites, in fact, uh, belong to a group known as the arthropods. And um, most people will be familiar with arthropods in the form of insects, flies and animals like spiders and the like. And in the, in the sea, uh, various sorts of um, crab and lobster and crustacean. So what turned out with regard to the, the Burgess Shale is that trilobites are very well known in the fossil record because they have a robust skeleton, which is not invulnerable, but normally preserves without much difficulty as a fossil. Plus the fact that actually, like most arthropods, they periodically discard their skeleton because as they grow in size, they may need to make a new skeleton to encapsulate them. And this means, of course, that they actually make multiple fossils, and that's rather helpful. But the point is that once we go back to the Burgess Shale, we see that there is an amazing, but truly amazing variety of arthropods, some of which are trilobite-like, other ones are not particularly similar. But it suddenly turns out, and this is not an area I have researched myself, but it turns out that the trilobites are just one part of what we call an evolutionary tree. And indeed, the trilobites flourished. And indeed, we largely depend on the information of the hard parts of trilobites for many tens of millions of years into the future until eventually they disappear in a mass extinction. So they are one part of an ingredient but on the other hand, when we know what the totality of diversity, the totality of forms was as revealed by the Burgess Shale, they actually turn out to be a rather insignificant component. So at this time, for you, Simon, when you look at the Cambrian explosion, what to you is exciting about this time now? You've told us the scientific fact about it. But when you look at it, what comes to mind? Is there something that is telling you that there was evolution that staggered for some time? What does this tell us besides what we are able to look at in the fossil records? Um, I, I, think it, I think it tells us a number of things. Um, to begin with, it is still not really clear what might have triggered this diversification, this radiation of, of animals. Some people, for instance, suggest that the levels of oxygen were increasing and there may well have been important changes in the way that the oceans were structured. And I'm not an expert on that area at all. Um, there's still a lot of debate. What we do know is that not so long before the Cameron explosion, much of the um, planet was covered with glaciers. It went into a sort of super ice age. And some people have suggested that as the ice caps retreated back to the poles, this may have mean, meant that conditions changed so that the very first animals were able to establish a foothold. But this is controversial and there is, to be honest, no general agreement. So, indeed, if you want to work in that area, there's a great deal to discover. I think from my perspective, um, the thing which fascinates me is that we are still dealing with unfinished business. So, for example, I am very interested in the origin of our own group, uh, which, as I mentioned, includes the vertebrates, but a number of other animal groups. 
which um, in um, popular parlance would be called things like sea urchins and starfish and those sorts of things. But in any event, and again, without going into all the technical details, there are some very, very strange animals, especially from China, which I've looked at a lot, which we think are probably the very earliest representatives of this major group. But they don't look like anything we would expect. They don't look like what the textbooks say. And this means one of two things, of course. It may be that our interpretations are incorrect, and that's fine. You know, we do the best we can at the time. But I think more importantly, it reminds us that if indeed we're on the right track here, it's essential to have a fossil record in the same way as in history. If you cannot interpret the ruins of ancient cities, if you cannot read their vanished um, uh, accounts of themselves, maybe carved into stone or maybe uh, on paper or something like that, then your knowledge of history is almost non-existent. So if we did not have a fossil record, it would be effectively not impossible, but more difficult to understand the history of life. Because, of course, there are many other lines of evidence and indeed very important evidence now comes, for example, from molecular biology. So with respect to the Cambrian explosion, this is all work in progress. And um, it's not something I've done so much work on in the last few years. But collectively, from Stephen Jay Gould's original book, Wonderful Life, from my interest in evolutionary convergence, that allowed me to keep on, if I may say so, diversifying into broader and broader areas. And one has to say that if you want to be a scientist, there are two things which are wonderful about it. The first is it's usually surprising. You discover fossils which nobody has seen beforehand, and sometimes they're very difficult to interpret. So there's a real challenge there. And as I say, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But more importantly, um, some areas which were a real struggle for you many years ago now look rather mundane, as we would say, rather easy. In other words, to the first approximation, the problems are being solved, and that's good. But of course, they provoke many, many more questions. So, for example, one can then ask about evolutionary convergence. Why is it so widespread? What sort of implications does it have? If we agree, for example, that something like a human is very likely to evolve, then one can say that this should apply not only on planet Earth, but fairly broadly across the rest of the universe, wherever there is a planet which is habitable. If we also say, well, wait a minute, every now and again, the history of the Earth is punctuated by terrible disasters, which we call mass extinctions, maybe my thesis of the likelihood of a human evolving has been overthrown because maybe the mass extinctions reset the evolutionary agenda. So all of these really big questions, and in every case, there are thousands of people working on them because they are such huge questions, are ones that as a scientist, had I been asked when I was a young man, now some years ago, I would have never dreamt of thinking about. But here we are, all ready to talk about them. Right. And you talked about biology uh, some time ago when you just mentioned molecular biology. And we seem to see that within biology as well, we do understand that for these cells to operate, there has to be instructions that come in. It also needs different environment. So the environment in China would have been different to, for example, Burgess shells or Canada where you've moved. And would that have made a difference? Because the cells are receiving information, but they then have to read that information. And depending on the environment that they are in, they can accordingly uh, manifest that particular action. So do you think that is interesting for you? Um, it, of course, it's an interesting question because nobody uh, from Darwin onwards would doubt that the sort of environment you find yourself in is going to have a very major influence on the sorts of organisms, plants, animals and so forth, which can actually live there. So clearly living at the bottom of a trench in the Pacific Ocean is rather different from living in the Amazon. And in each and every case, you will find that, um, yes, indeed, animals are adapted, as indeed Darwin showed. But having said that, um, if one looks at the Burgess Shale from British Columbia, 
and the deposits in southwest China. Uh, they're known as the Chengjiang, uh, and there's some similar deposits um, of slightly younger age from the same localities in China. Actually, to the first approximation, they're surprisingly similar. And this is despite the fact that probably in China, the water was a great, de a great deal shallower. Although in both cases, because of what we call plate tectonics, the ancient continents, which we now recognize as North America and as part of China, were in fact both located along the equator. And of course, in the last half billion years, these continents have been moving and sliding all over the place at a geologically relatively rapid rate. So yes, indeed, there, there are aspects of, of, of environmental control such that one can extend that slightly and say, if one was, and this is looking forward a little bit, for instance, but we're interested in, in, the, in, in whether, for instance, something like a human might evolve. Well, we can say, would it be highly intelligent? Yes. Uh, but on the other hand, there are animals which live in the water, dolphins, whales, which are also highly intelligent. But of course, they went back into the water because their ancestors were terrestrial. And correspondingly, if you have a technology, ultimately, the general consensus is, is, is that will evolve on land rather than underwater. So if you go to different marine environments, if you go to a coral reef, or if you go to near the Antarctic, there will be many different things to look at. But on the other hand, by and large, in any one of these environments, uh, you'll find uh, the same groups, but evolving in slightly different ways to meet those particular environmental challenges. So, yes, naturally, the environment is part of the story. And indeed, if you turn the environment upside down in a mass extinction where things go very badly wrong and there's extreme stress to the ecosystems, then it's not a happy time for anybody. And with evolution generally you have we have seen that one of the features is there seems to be a drive towards simplicity here and you also spoke about intelligence i would like to come uh, to intelligence and language in some time but when we now move this story forward and get to early plant and animal life was there a need for this simplification to happen and then intelligence followed by language so is this can i assume that this naturally was going to be the process or it happened that simpler forms developed intelligence and then intelligence led to language i, I don't even know if i've got that sequence right yeah thank you um i i i don't with respect i don't think i'd use the word simplification um in as much as it, 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 in my new book, what, what I observe, apart from anything else, is that however far you go back into geological time, it's very difficult to find anything which is actually genuinely simple. Uh, everything seems to be incredibly complex, almost right from the beginning. And that, I think, actually poses some questions for evolutionary biologists. And it is the case that as you go through geological time, very often you find what we might refer to as a streamlining. In other words, they become more economic in a way. But we have to be careful in biology because you can have an organism which looks superficially relatively simple. But in fact, when you begin to go into the details of it, it is incredibly complex. And indeed, if you look at the interior working of any cell, the degree and sophistication of the biochemistry is totally extraordinary. It's absolutely remarkable. All these myriad chemical reactions being accelerated by biological catalysts, which we call enzymes and things like that. So in a sense, um, again, trying to step back very slightly on this, um, I would sort of argue that one of our crucial questions is to investigate how land became populated, how animals invaded land, how plants invaded land, because oddly enough, once the land is occupied, the bulk of the diversity of life, the range of forms actually is on land. And there are various reasons for this. 
And amongst that, then one then has further observations that we have lots of examples whereby we get what appears to be more sophisticated forms evolving. So, for example, if we think of our own group, the vertebrates, uh, by definition, the, the ones in the water we call fish. And there is a wonderful fossil record which shows in a remarkable way how a certain group of fish transformed their fins into legs. And this was a fairly gradual process. But amongst other things, we can now show from the fossil record that several groups within these fish were independently transforming their legs, sorry, transforming their fins into, mm -hmm. into legs, which from my way of thinking suggests once again, that actually if one group for whatever reason had failed, had gone extinct for whatever reason, then another group would have got there sooner or later. And then when we look at this, and again, I'm simplifying enormously, um, not, not, not to in any way sort of simplify it because it's too difficult to understand. But the, again, with, with science, sometimes you have to see a big picture. And so right. we move from fish to animals which are familiar to, I'm sure, many of your listeners, frogs and so forth, what we call the amphibians. We then move to the reptiles, again, familiar to many of you, especially in India in the form of lizards and the like, and snakes, of course. Uh, some of which are, I believe, extremely dangerous. And then we go from the reptiles to the group we call the mammals. And that includes ourselves. And amongst other things, uh, mammals are warm blooded and by and large, by and large, tend to have larger brains. And within that group of mammals, there are many different forms. Elephants will be one example. Others go back into the ocean. We call them whales. One group tended to live mostly in the trees and we call them primates. And amongst the primates, ultimately, there were the great apes. And from within one, within one group of great apes, of course, close to a chimpanzee is where the humans come from. And in that particular case, and again, this begs many, many questions. But here we are talking to each other using this astonishing technology. And that is something which seems to be unique to humans. And you might say, well, of course it's unique. What else do you expect? But the fact of the matter is, and again, this might be another part of the discussion. When we look around us, animals are clearly intelligent in many, many different sorts of ways. Animals clearly can learn. Animals can clearly memorize. But quite how you focus this is an interesting point. But to begin with, they may well make sounds. They often do but they do not speak. They do not have language. Before we go forward, I just want to understand a term that maybe you can explain to us a little better. And that is the Darwin zone, because you spoke about this movement from, from, from early fossils and we've come right down to mammals. What is the significance of Darwin zone and, and, and <laughs> why, we, why is it interesting uh, here? Well, thank you. Um, uh, there's there's always a risk, and I mean this, of course, you know, it, with respect. There's always a risk, though, that when you make when you coin a term, it it gets it takes on a life of its own. And um, if there, are, I'm sure, are many of your listeners, if I said something like Red Queen hypothesis, they would all nod and say, yes, that's right. And we don't have time, probably, to explain what the Red Queen hypothesis is, but it's another part of evolution. And so, with Darwin's own, um, very roughly, and it's based on a, a very interesting piece of work by a colleague of mine, uh, actually in this country, in, in, in England, um, which shows that, first of all, as we have observed, um, there's abundant convergence. But also, it seems that there are ultimately limits to what is possible. And in the particular case they were dealing with, which is actually to do with our friends, the arthropods, and the way that the uh, limbs can be reorganized in various sorts of ways there is a sort of view like an upper limit of what is of what is possible in terms of rearrangement uh, but interesting what they said is there's a there's a tiny bit of extra space which potentially could be occupied but somehow seems to be unobtainable and maybe this says only well there's not enough time yet just give us a few more hundred million years and we'll go there but the more general point which I think I was trying to make is that with one crucial exception, 
there are limits in what is possible with regard to evolutionary occupation. And to some extent, this is governed by the physical constraints of the world around us. Gravity, the nature of water, all these sorts of things mean that you have to obey certain rules. But there are many sorts of examples one can look at whereby one can suggest that actually the groups in um, question have explored basically all possibilities. They're not going to do much else. They'll keep on doing it, and that's all very interesting. And every now and again, you have a certain sort of innovation. So, for example, in the time of the dinosaurs, there was one group which actually became quite small and for various reasons became warm-blooded. And to insulate itself, developed scales, which actually looked like feathers. And also, because of course in animal life in particular, uh, communication, both in terms of aggression and sexual attraction, are the sorts of things which you can explain very obviously when you look at a peacock. So those sorts of things were the necessary precursors but the end result was something we call the bird. And at that time, of course, there were already flying reptiles. They were called the pterosaurs. But basically, the birds began to take over the world. So, yes, there are all sorts of adventures like the evolution of birds. And now when we look around us, and I know that's true of India especially, there's this incredible variety of the birds. But even so, I think there are limits to what the birds were ever going to do. I mean, in parenthesis, I mean, one of the curiosities, and there's been a lot of discussion about this, but why do birds always have to lay eggs? Why didn't they manage to give birth to live young as we do? And you might say, well, giving birth to live young is what mammals do, the mothers do. But actually, there are lots of other groups which also give birth to live young. And these include some fish and also many lizards. So that too is convergent. But in any event, the idea that if you like, the whole of the evolutionary story is surrounded by, and here I use an English word, uh, penumbra, which comes, of course, from a Latin word. But there's a sort of zone at the edge, which is very, very difficult to go further. And the crucial exception to that is just the one species. And that species is talking to each other and listening to each other at the moment. That's us. True. And the Darwin zone, like you just explained, is taken forward really well uh, by you. And I think there's a chapter in your book where you speak about the myth of randomness. So it connects straight away with what you have just said, because the more you step back rather, and the more time you give this particular process, randomness tends to decrease. Would you say that is an accurate uh, observation? I think so. Yes. I mean, again, um, it's probably just as well we're not using um, a video like Zoom or something because uh, I, 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 you know, it, it, there's a lot of facial expressions. Um, and mm. the reason why I sort of um, I smile to myself um, is that so many of these words are, are, have, are, are, are sort of, you know, if you like. Uh, and this is with all respect, of course, are, are sort of loaded. You know, they have, all, as we say in English, all sorts of connotations. And indeed, in terms of randomness. And I, I agree with you as it happens uh, in this in this context, because um, in all aspects, when we look at evolution and we look at the both the process through history and also the endpoints, then there seems to be a surprising predictability in it. And that's almost to go full circle back to Darwin, because if and I'm not, but if I was a physicist, I'm not nearly clever enough to be a physicist or even a chemist. Uh, they deal with, in many ways, an extremely predictable universe. It's based on laws. Um, and of course, again, fascinatingly, as you go towards the far end of particle physics, everything becomes very, very murky and very difficult to understand. And you think of quantum mechanics in particular. Whereas from the time of Darwin and maybe before Darwin, the general view has been that evolution is completely open ended and almost anything could happen within the broad constraints of, 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 as I mentioned, of physics, gravity, and, and the chemistry. And of course, it's, for example, almost certainly no accident that all life forms, at least here, and I think across the universe, depend on the element carbon, for example. Whereas in various sorts of ways, it seems that actually evolution 
is not so random. And in fact, it's got a strong element of directionality in it. And so mass extinctions, which are normally thought to radically redirect the course of evolution, I would argue, in fact, oddly enough, are actually the exact reverse. They actually assist the process towards various endpoints. And here, I, of course, I speak metaphorically. I'm not saying somebody is actively controlling mass extinctions. And similarly, as we've already discussed, evolutionary convergence suggests that the number of possible endpoints is surprisingly restricted. And it's probably taking us a little too far into other areas. But in effect, if you think about the possible number of combinations, in other words, you can, even if you've got a rather small number of things you want to mix together, you only need, you know, 50 or so. And if you look at every single possible alternative, the number's very big indeed. It's, it's a, a sort of combinatorial problem. And you can actually show in biology that in principle, the total number of combinations which might potentially exist is just staggeringly large. It's much more than the number of particles in the visible universe. They're gigantic numbers. And yet here on Earth, we see not only a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that list of possibilities, but the fact that they keep on re-evolving in very much the same way suggests to me that once again, there are really quite, con quite strong constraints on what is possible. True. And you were mentioning about the mass extinction events. And I guess most of our listeners who are non-experts would definitely know the mass extinction event as far as the dinosaurs were concerned. And you did mention the, the transition to mammals. Had that event not happened, what do you think would have been our story? Or would there have been a story? Or we can't even think about it because here we are talking to each other now. Um, well, the thing here, well, first of all, the, the, the event which interests us very much is, is um, uh, what happened at the end of the Cretaceous about 66 million years ago. And here, as uh, many of your listeners will, will know, um, uh, India plays a key part because it was probably principally because of enormous volcanic eruptions in the area, uh, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, the Deccan in northern India. And these were colossal volcanic eruptions, and they led to all sorts of changes in the atmosphere. And this was not good news. They are, these are eruptions beyond any human imagination. But coincidentally, to make things much worse, on the other side of the planet, an asteroid plowed into an area which is uh, now part of Mexico. And so probably this combination of the asteroid impact, this extraterrestrial body, and um, the continuing eruptions in Dakar uh, led to severe environmental stress. And indeed, the dinosaurs, more or less as a direct result, went extinct. And the mammals took over the world. And indeed, we are one of the descendants of those successful groups. However, what is well known, but if you like, a little bit underplayed, is that the mammals themselves, the group to which we belong, was already busy evolving in the Cretaceous at the time of the dinosaurs. And the cliche is that these mammals were terribly small and terribly frightened and spent all their time smaller than mice, skulking in the undergrowth, eating insects and trying to avoid being trodden on by a dinosaur the dinosaurs as it happens are pretty enormous creatures by and large but actually that's that's too much of a simplification for two reasons first of all it's clear that even in the cretaceous during the time of the dinosaurs some of the mammals were getting quite big some were about the size of a dog now it's not enormous but that particular mammal actually ate baby dinosaurs so the complement was being returned if you like and also it is clear that the mammals in the time of the dinosaurs were already beginning to diversify. They were already beginning to spread their wings, so to speak. And what I would suggest is that, yes, indeed, the asteroid and the volcanic eruptions reset the agenda to the advantage of the mammals and also, as it happens, the birds. But the mammals and the birds would have got there in the end sooner or later because they have a number of features 
which, if you like, are not found in the um, dinosaurs approximately. And amongst those are greater intelligence, larger brain size, the ability to manipulate things, what we call dexterity. They're warm blooded. They control their body temperatures. They are more social by and large. And as we know, a number of these primates in particular, and in a parallel way in the birds, also use tools. So we stop at that point and say, well, that's all very interesting. But there's something else to remember. And that is that in the history of this planet, mass extinctions occur very roughly every 200 million years, say. But also other things happen, and I mentioned that uh, at near the beginning of, of our conversation, uh, of ice ages. And sometime after the end of the Cretaceous, the planet begins to refrigerate. Now that affects not the tropical zones, but the polar zones. But in the, well, it's again, those of you who have traveled to the Himalayas and places like that will be perfectly familiar with this. Um, temperate and near polar zones are not places where reptiles are so common. These are the places where the warm blooded birds and the warm blooded mammals will flourish. And my counterfactual history would be that in due course, there will be the emergence of an intelligent tool making species, which will seal the fate of the dinosaurs. So the take home message is that, first of all, groups like the birds and the mammals are going to get there sooner or later. But the second take home message is that effectively mass extinctions give you time for nothing. In other words, they accelerate a process which is going to happen come what may. So the paradox is that although if you study geology at a university, you will be told how destructive and terrible mass extinctions are. And that's absolutely correct. On the day itself, they are truly ghastly. But in the longer term, paradoxically, mass extinctions are actually creative. True. So what I get from listening to what you've just said is, irrespective of these mass extinctions, and I'll just stay with mammals for now, because it forms our lineage, we were on a path to intelligence to be followed by language. And given enough of time, whether dinosaurs were around or not around, our intelligence would have evolved and then we come to tools and to language next. When you talk about intelligence and language, something that has struck me is uh, how much do you think we understand about language? Because we speak to each other and to everybody around us. So we have got a very good understanding of our own language. But when it comes to communication and if animals have evolved and survived this long, I do know that the added advantage we have is we build narratives and we build stories and, and we can get through that. That's fine. But do we understand animal communication really well before we can say that maybe that could evolve as well, given time? There's, there's another language to evolve there parallelly. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, that many animals uh, vocalize. Indeed, I have a colleague visiting here in Cambridge at the moment who's very interested in the way that frogs vocalize as it happens. And the point, I think, is that even in the case of birdsong, which to our ears is very beautiful in many cases, um, it's being pointed out that actually this looks very much like a language in a number of ways. One, for example, and here we're talking about the birds where they are taught to sing rather than they have it in a way which we would refer to as innate. In other words, it's, it's an instinctive process. This is where the um, parent very often the, the male bird tutors the young. And in this process, um, the young birds go through what we call a babbling phase where they experiment with the songs. And um, any of you who have children or have nephews or nieces or anything like that, around about 18 months, maybe a bit before, sometimes a bit later, they go through this fabulous stage where they're beginning to experiment with the mother tongue, as we would call it, their language. And, it, you know, they gabble all over the place. And then quite quickly, suddenly individual words appear. And within often a few months, they're speaking whole sentences. And I, I regard this as absolutely fascinating. I, I remember with my own children and also now with my grandchildren as well. And the second point about birdsong, which seems to have a direct parallel 
to human language is of course it's relatively complex and they can move around things in different sorts of ways so they can reorder segments of their song in the same way that depending precisely what sort of language you're speaking so for example was I to speak German which I don't really know very well then what I do with my verbs is actually a bit different from what we do in English and I don't doubt the same applies to the many languages in India but the point about this is that actually these similarities between birdsong and human language are basically superficial and again it would take a long time to try and unpack all of this but it also I believe applies across all animal sounds or vocalizations but in essence all animal vocalizations are if you like shallow they have no depth to them and also they do not seem to convey meanings in the way that human language does they can for instance uh, include something we call an alarm call which says be careful something dangerous is around and they can indeed be used for sexual attraction or indeed aggression all of that is true but what you don't see is them using what superficially we might call a word in a completely new context so they can't transfer the bird song from the immediate necessity of mate attraction or aggression or whatever into something where they could say more or less to their mate would you mind bringing a few more sticks to build that nest uh, they don't do that and this applies across all animal vocalization and it is effectively that um, animal language is if you like to use an english word it, it is imperative it is merely command whereas our one is declarative because we are actually conveying meaning and the problem i think is that in trying to understand what to my way of thinking is human uniqueness is that we are the worst people to study it because we're studying ourselves know yourself as they say in philosophy and so it's really difficult to stand outside oneself and that's perhaps why science is important because it does try and impart some degree of distance from the the you the person versus the problem uh, it's that's actually simplifying rather too much I fear but the point about language is and indeed I hear I'm working on other people's um, papers and, and books and so forth um, is that um, it's deeply cognitive it's not just a stream of words it's not just a stream of commands it is something where in particular human sentences can be combined in an almost infinite number of ways. And not only that, but they not only convey meaning, but we can embed meaning within meaning within meaning. And then once we've got to that stage, and this is known as recursion, then not only that, but our language, again, emphasizing why it is a cognitive process, uses metaphors, it uses analogies, it compares things which actually are not at all similar, but we all understand what we're talking about. And also, and you might gather from the way I speak, it allows us to tell jokes. True. And I know we are limited for time, so I'm trying to drop in two quick questions to you here, and then I'll let you decide how you're going to answer those. When we just spoke about animals and language, we do also notice you spoke about young babies and we've experienced that as, as they grow up, but they have to be nourished and nurtured and, and cuddled into that kind of an environment. A domestic animal compared to a wild animal. One is, is a domestic animal smarter than a wild animal? Because we do see actual footage of certain animals who tend to have certain vocal representations that sound like language. I wouldn't say it is language. That is, that, that's my first question. Mm -hmm. And the second is when you talk about language and you spoke about they are not able to uh, probably form words, yes, but how important is consciousness here? Because oh. as we evolved as humans, where we start understanding ourselves and then we are symbolically able to take ourselves out of the story. So without meta-consciousness and without being able to look at it from a third person point of view would language ever evolve in any animal mm, thank you um very briefly with the question of animals which are brought up in the company of humans 
uh, by and large, uh, they tend to be more intelligent. It's not quite as simple as that, because in fact, if you look at the brain size of domesticated animals, cows, goats, sheep, that sort of thing, uh, actually their brain sizes tend to be a bit smaller. But the reason for that is probably that they are no longer threatened by predators. And therefore, they don't have to spend half their time looking around the field to make sure they're not going to be eaten. But if one deals with the laboratory animals where you're doing endless experiments to determine their ability to understand something or to make a tool or whatever, by and large, they are actually conspicuously smarter than their cousins in the jungle. And um, there's one particular example, for instance, to do with what we call mirror self-recognition. So we all look in the mirror and we say to ourselves, oh, I'm a handsome chap and that sort of business. Um, and indeed, there are some animals which appear to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror. And so the temptation to say, oh, well, they're self-aware. They, they realize that they themselves are reflected. Um, but in point of fact, it turns out that nearly all the examples of what we call mirror self-recognition are found in animals which live in human company. They are, as we say in the trade, enculturated. And the thing about these is that the animal itself, if you like, has huge benefits because, of course, it's, as you say, cosseted and looked after and fed and leads, in some cases, a quite sheltered existence. And, of course, it's observing humans the whole time. It's not stupid. But despite all that, it will never, ever learn to speak. If it is trained endlessly, it might approximate to human sounds. If it is trained endlessly, it might finally work out that in between six and four, there is a number called five. But my thesis is that it would never actually know what five is, let alone realize that five plus seven is 12. So, yes, indeed, there is this sort of um, observation that if you really want to understand animals so far as you can, you want to study them in the wild. But even there, humans are everywhere. Hu Animals aren't stupid. They know what humans are like. They observe. The second point about consciousness, indeed, uh, like you, I agree entirely. Animals are conscious. Animals have emotions. Um, animals, as I mentioned, aren't stupid. But there are a couple of things which, in one way or another, suggest that, unlike ourselves, they can never think themselves into the position of another animal. They can observe that animal. They can see what it's doing. They can anticipate its actions in some cases. But what they can never do is stand in the shoes of that other animal. And there are a number of ways in which we can think about this. Um, but in essence, one I came across very recently, and I thought it was extremely telling, is not only to do with their utter lack, lack of language. And this is a paper I only came across a few weeks ago. So it's not mentioned in the book, is that amongst the apes in particular, but also amongst the whales, dolphins and things like that, when they've been separated for some time, and in the case of the chimpanzees, which might radiate out across the jungle, and they may not meet again for several weeks, then when they meet, they greet each other with enthusiasm. They're delighted to see each other. It's a, it's a wonderful moment. Everybody's very happy. They're all jumping around and kissing and doing all the things you should do when you meet, a, meet, meet people you've not seen for a long time. We shake hands with long lost friends, that sort of thing. However, believe it or not, they never, ever say goodbye. Never. They don't actually wave and say, you know, best of luck, old boy. You know, we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. You know, take care of yourself. Love to love to the love to the arm, this sort of business. And that actually tells me something central about what animals don't have. And that is that their capacity to reflect on themselves, or to put it another way, animals will never be actors. They will never, they can mimic, but they'll never find themselves on the stage, if you like, and recast themselves completely. Whereas if we, of course, in fact, have a whole set of different ways which we'd like the world to see us, and we'll present ourselves to our family in one way, perhaps, to a total stranger in another way. And we will keep on changing our behavior to try and match and be as socially conformable as possible. And we could talk about this for a great deal longer, but all of it seems to sort of boil down to the fact that animals don't speak, as I think you mentioned in the introduction, animals don't tell stories, and thereby, effectively, they don't have a history. And crucially, animals can learn, of course, they have to, but animals will never teach. They cannot instruct a pupil. 
So, for instance, a chimpanzee mother will use a big rock to break open nuts. The juvenile chimpanzee beside her will observe. But if the juvenile tries to use the stone, not once with the mother chimpanzee, instruct it how to, you know, you, 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 know, you can see the human saying, no, no, hang on a moment. No, no, that, no, hold it that way. Don't be silly. Come on, get it right. Now, mind your foot, for goodness sake. And so it goes on. And it is because they cannot, it appears, enter into the mind of the pupil. They cannot put themselves in that place. And thereby, if they're not able to teach, to convey information, they're never going to have a history. And that, in a way, is how we found ourselves in all intents and purposes in a completely new world. And from our perspective, it is one of unlimited possibility. True. And interestingly, you've just mentioned that animals could never have a history. And I want to just get to what Owen Barfield said in Saving the Appearances, mm -hmm. where he spoke about human consciousness, which was an interaction with nature. And then we understand man's history, circumstances, and then we come to destiny. So if you say as humans, we have a history, animals don't, and we, we probably understand that. But then let's talk for some time about destiny, because if you talk about destiny, then we are talking about a, a telos to all of this and a direction, and we are all going in a direction. What do you think about that? Oh, why do you leave the easiest questions to the end? I ask myself. <laughs> I'm very glad you mentioned Owen Barfield. And again, um, I don't expect he's a particularly familiar figure in, in, in India. Perhaps, perhaps he is. I hope he is. But if you don't know the name, then uh, he's well worth looking at. Um, quite difficult to understand sometimes, but a very, very original thinker. A and indeed, Barfield, amongst other things, had very original ideas about language and its origins. And he also suggested that in a way, even our consciousness has not been the same. So, you know, one might go back um, a few hundred years or you might go back to Mughal times, perhaps, or you might go further back to the civilizations in the Indus Valley or even further back. And he suggested that the sort of consciousness those people possess was not really quite the same as ours. And I think that's just in parenthesis incredibly important because I don't know how things are in India, but here we, you know, are always sort of, you know, apologizing for our history. Well, we've all made bad mistakes. This is not in dispute. Um, but on the other hand, actually getting yourself, putting yourself into the mental framework of somebody living even 500 years ago can be incredibly difficult. Yes, they love their children. Yes, they could be aggressive, aggressive but there are other aspects of their lives which really are quite alien to us. And that ability to project yourself back into a historical past is a very it's a very rare gift and it's something you can't be ignored um so indeed uh whether or not we accept barfield's uh, ideas about how human consciousness itself is evolving it's intimately linked again to language and language is both highly constructive because we can express very complex ideas but it can also be destructive because, of course, we can forget things or we, we can we can censor things and forget how to learn to speak in the same way as we can censor history. We forget what happened and rather than just being as open minded about it. And you will understand, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in fairly dangerous territory here because I know a little bit about about the history, of course, of India and, and my country. And, you know, there are lots and lots of aspects to talk about. But then you talk again bravely about telos and destiny and of course this links to a whole series of different religious traditions and they have various ways of regarding it perhaps either as a nirvana as i believe a buddhist might argue or indeed and i hope i don't do it a disservice to at least some of the main indian religions one of cyclicities or indeed ones which uh, culminate in some grand ending and I couldn't possibly arbitrate between these because in a certain sense, I think they're all trying to articulate something which is far beyond our understanding and not necessarily as different as you might at first sight think. And my own view would be that um, actually the um, process of history may well be as we now move into completely new territory. Is it not? It's never final. It's never going to end. And some people might find that rather depressing. They said, for goodness sake, can't we just sit down for a moment? 
Uh, and the, the why I think that might be the case, and this is going really far, as we say in English, it's actually based from a French word, off piste, we're, we're really going off into other sorts of directions, is that one of the great hopes at the moment is that we will be able to make contact with extraterrestrials. And there are many reasons why people are optimistic that this is very much on the cards. I'm much less optimistic. But one of them is simply, if you like, to have an independent voice, to have somebody else to talk to, to compare notes and all the rest of it. And I suspect, and again, this is very difficult to summarize in less than a minute, but I suspect in point of fact, so far as we can talk about a future, it will involve a future beyond our imagining. And by the way, so far as I am concerned, this is not something which I think is going to be a question of downloading ourselves onto a computer, heaven help us, or any other sort of so-called artificial intelligence or AI. There's a great deal of enthusiasm about that. But I've read several papers recently which effectively point out that, and this is something which, of course, I may again be proved wrong. And again, I'm quoting other people, but computers will never think. And the reason for that is that they require to work symbolic logic and symbolic logic cannot produce a narrative. And although I can be a scientist, my richest experiences are when I'm either telling a story or listening to a story or finding myself in a story. And that's what makes us human. Very true. And I think rightly in your book, which is titled From Extraterrestrials to Animal Minds, in the title, I, I, I get a feeling that it's moving in the other direction. And I don't know if that is intentional because it's not from animal minds to extraterrestrials, but it's the other way around. Uh, as far as I was trying to understand this title. So I don't know whether you selected the title uh, and, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and the book. Well, thank you very much for mentioning the book. Um, uh, I, 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 it, it is, I mean, uh, by and large, if, if there's something to catch the eye of the public, it will be the word extraterrestrial. I mean, animal minds are fine and, you know, there are lots of people and I have friends here who work on these questions. Um, uh, but you're, I agree with you in, in sense of the direction um, and the word from, of course, here is, is, is in a sense is 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 is, is, is a sort of link rather than a direction to it. Um, and in, in that book, as we briefly discussed, um, in each one of the cases, I address an area of what might be regarded as, as received wisdom in evolutionary biology. And argue unhelpfully, perhaps, for the exact opposite. So, for example, as we've discussed, mass extinctions, very destructive. No contest, but paradoxically creative. Animal minds, just like ours, and a question of simple evolutionary continuity between great apes and ourselves, as Darwin proposed. In terms of evolutionary history, of course, but in terms of the, I think, unbridgeable gap between ourselves and any animal mind, we've entered into some new realm and we can argue and speculate how we have been given access to that realm. Was it by chance? Was it by invitation or some other process? I, I try and keep an open mind. And correspondingly, for example, as already touched on very briefly, the myth of missing links. Of course, there are missing links. That is, the continuity of evolution means that animals which started as one ancestral form and look utterly different from their descendant, the fossil record enables us to actually track those processes and correspondingly the myth of simplicity well in a way um, as we discussed uh, there is something a little bit akin to simplification but more importantly you go back and look at the very dawn of life and it seems to be already fantastically complicated it's not simply a, if you like a, a, a progressive progress from you know very simple to very complex so the idea as ever, and knowing that perhaps a few of the people listening are thinking, should I become a scientist? Because after all, it's a very competitive field. Uh, you have to study for years. Uh, you can often have disappointments and all those sorts of things. But if there's any sort of advertisement, it is the realization that although you have to work on a very specialized area at school, at university, and then perhaps if you continue, as time moves on, 
you find your interests becoming wider and wider and wider. And you suddenly realize that your friends in the university, those who studied literature or mathematics or music, all have something to say to you. And with any luck, we've got something to say to them. Right. And Simon, I have to tell you, I've got a copy of the book. I have read it. I have found it extremely interesting. Uh, I love the way you have set the chapters up because something that I was maybe I've overanalyzed the book. I tend to overanalyze books sometimes and that may not even be the intention, but that's how I see it. And besides all the fascinating uh, information that you've put into your book, when I sat back and after reading it, I was trying to look at, okay, how else can I look at this book? You very clearly tell us a story about life that moved from water, then to land, then to the air. Now, if I just looked at these three things, and maybe I'm overthinking this here. So this seems to be moving in a, in a direction, right? You move from sea to mm -hmm. land, then you get wings, and then you start flying. Symbolically, if I add consciousness into this, there seems to be an upward trajectory here. As humanity, as human beings, should we in any way look at this and use it as an analogy of where we should be going? Because that's how it has happened, or that's how evolution has moved us. Well, you're very fair in your question, and I don't want to sound evasive. Um, I would certainly agree on the record that there is a telos, as we say, there is a sense of purpose in the universe. Um, and then in part, that goes on to the very active debates at the moment about the nature of consciousness. What is it? I mean, is it just inside our brains or is it something whereby mind is universal? Or is it, in fact, that mind preceded anything in the physical universe? And it's fairly clear, I think, to many people now that a material explanation for consciousness isn't going to work. Uh, now, not everybody will agree with that, of course. But as has been suggested many times in the past, the notion that perhaps our brains are more analogous to an antenna or a radio receiver uh, actually in some ways, I think, is uh, m more useful for trying to understand the consciousness. And that, of course, goes in part back to Owen Barfield. But beyond that, I mean, certainly in terms of evolution in, in its strict sense, um, talking about purpose and a telos is a big no-no. And it's very amusing, I think, that you see many biologists who struggle they, they keep on saying you know this, this it looks as if there's something going on here but they can't quite articulate their disquiet and they try and treat the whole thing as just an area where materialism will explain everything and they may be right they may be right we must remember that but i think that it's right at the edges of the science which if you're lucky you might have one or two excursions which provoke you as to wonder whether these you know, other aspects, which we've somewhat taken for granted, need to be reinterpreted. And, and as already mentioned, I think that applies to consciousness because you know, consciousness is just other. It's, not, it's just simply not material. It, it's different. Um, and w whether that allows us, I think, I suppose the only, the, the, the grain of comfort, as we'd say in English to this, is that, our ability to understand things may, from an animal perspective, be almost miraculous. But in point of fact, if we think about what might be there yet to, to learn, so to speak, to comprehend, to enjoy, um, we may be just on the mere edges of, of a different set of worlds. Um, and um, this is obviously something which reflects um, quite considerably various religious traditions. And once again, if you go and look at science, very approximately, chemists and physicists quite often may have one or other religion. Biologists generally much less often. And, you know, we can discuss why that might be the case. But despite all that, I think one needs to be open to you know, the sort of, to use the technical phrase, this existentialist uncertainty that we're not guaranteed anything. You know, and I think, again, you can understand why people want safety and certainty and security. And those are good things in your life. But one has to realize that in terms of knowledge and cognition, it may be that there are enormous ranges of inquiry 
which we don't even know how to articulate, but we will perhaps one day. I just want to read something from somebody who I'm hoping that we can speak to next on this podcast as well, who is uh, one of my favorite authors. And he's written something in your book. So I want to quote what he said. And I'm talking about uh, Rupert Sheldrick. Oh, yes. Where he has spoken about morphic resonance. And I don't think we have the time to get into that. He says, this book opens a fresh perspective on the evolutionary process. A very welcome change from the neo-Darwinian orthodoxy that has predominated us for so long. Convey Morris shows convincingly that long-term trends stretch over many millions of years. Developmental patterns occur again and again in many kinds of convergent evolution. And all this takes place in a universe built on imagination, altogether surprising and liberating. It kind of touches on what I was saying earlier after I read the book. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm very... I know Rupert Sheldrake a little bit. He's he, he's not a he's not a close friend or anything. We've had things, and like you and many other people, he's regarded uh, generally, at least in mainstream science, as as um, uh, 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 you know politely as eccentric and 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 in some cases a heretic. Whereas um, I, I don't doubt that some of his ideas uh, are pretty far fetched. But I, I like him try to keep an open mind about all these sorts of things. And indeed, you know, Kate, it brings us full circle back to the question of consciousness and those sorts of things. So he's written a number of very thought provoking books. And I believe it's a case also, of course, he was originally in Cambridge uh, and worked here as a sort of botanist. But of course, he spent quite a lot of time in India and as a fairly young man, I believe. And I think that had an enormous influence on him as well. So it's also the case that, you know, one well, again, this is true of all humans, but, you know, it, it, it is essential. So I'm not preaching here, but it is essential to understand other traditions and cultures. And, you know, uh, and of course, all of them, as Barfield explains, are busy changing the whole time. Nothing is static. Nothing is set in stone in this area. Um, and the fact of the matter is, again, mentioning a little bit earlier that if you want to be a scientist, you know, that it's not always um, a wonderful experience, but the, the benefits are always much more than the, than 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 the uh, the uh, than the reverse. Um, but it is you know this possibility that um, there are areas which Sheldrake has written about which are still widely dismissed and and, and regarded with almost ridicule. Um, but they, like many other the things, are things where you are allowed to keep on saying, well, all right, okay. Like extraterrestrials, of course, as I said yesterday to somebody else, um, I don't think there are any extraterrestrials at all as we would know them. But tomorrow I might be completely wrong. There might be an announcement and a radio signal has been received and that's the end of the discussion. They're there. But I suspect, again, that you know what we're looking for, we're looking in the wrong place for the wrong sort of thing. And I think Sheldrake is very much in that camp that you know, there are aspects... And as he says kindly in that quotation you just you just uh, read, uh, the crucial thing is imagination. And that is something which, with great respect, I don't think animals possess. And it is that, because I read quite widely outside science, but it is this extraordinary ability to enter these new worlds. And I don't want to go on this very, uh, very much longer um, because of the patience of, of your listeners. Um, but last night I was reading a couple of ghost stories, uh, which are quite popular here in England. But there's one particular one which had the most fabulous sort of counterfactual set of, of possibilities whereby time and circumstances are mysteriously interchanged. And it was, it's written for children. And again, I, I would say don't be embarrassed to read books for children. They're often more fun than the ones written for the grown ups. But in any event, it's the imagination and the imaginative powers of ourselves which I find so absolutely thrilling. Simon, since we do have the word extraterrestrials on your book, and there will be a lot of people who are going to be tuning in to listen to a little bit more about what you think about this. So I think it would be right to spend some more time there. Now, what has been happening over the last two years, all of a sudden, and when I say all of a sudden, I mean mainstream, we've had senate hearings we've had government documents being decoded we've had objects that have not been identified 
I also spent some time talking to Avi Loeb from Harvard, who is starting his new sure. foundation. It's interesting that you probably have said what I think as well. Uh, I still look at all of this and think it is an unidentified object. And as long as it is unidentified, we should leave it as that. Because the fact that we are calling it unidentified, we then can't go on to describe what our imagination wants to tell us. Do you actually think that the universe has had enough of time for that? Because if we look at our planet, you're talking about 5 billion, we're talking about 14 billion for the universe, and then things cool down. Looking at our time span, I don't know whether there was enough of time for an intelligent species to actually evolve elsewhere. That's what I mean. Yeah. No, that, that that's 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 very that's a very fair summary. Um, I mean, it, and of course, there are many different ways we can approach this question. Um, the first thing, which certainly gave me very considerable pause for thought um, some years ago, is partly based on a number of papers by an Australian, well, he's originally American, Charlie Lineweaver. Um, and in essence, he and some other people have pointed out that indeed our solar system is a little less than five billion years old and the visible universe seems to date from about 14 billion years. But the first observation is that there are many solar systems which are much older than our solar system maybe three, four, even more billion years older. Now, if first of all, we assume that there are lots and lots of Earth-like planets, and the evidence of that is now extremely strong. And if we also assume that life evolves quite easily, and again, that's not agreed by everybody. If we also accept that evolutionary convergence is um, uh, prevalent, then something like a human is gonna evolve. So in other words, in principle, on some other planets, which far, far predate our planet, there will be intelligent species which might decide to go and visit the rest of the galaxy. And if that is the case, then they would probably arrive, maybe, at about the time of the Burgess Shale. And as I've written elsewhere, they would sort of go down to the lagoon and they're very, they're, I hope, uh, as many of you are in India, uh, they're very adventurous cooks as we are here, I hope, and we always want to try something new. And they see these little fish-like objects swimming in the shallow water. They say, well, I wonder what they taste like. And they scoop them up and they fry them and they have a lovely white chilled wine. Very good too. And of course, there's only one problem. Those little fish are our ancestors. That's us. So our history ends there. If we were colonized in the time of the Burgess Shale, we simply wouldn't be here. So the difficulty then is why is there no evidence of visits, even in the fossil record? And we'll come back to what might count as a visit in just a second. And this then devolves into something which is generally referred to as a Fermi paradox. Um, this is articulated by the physicist Enrico Fermi shortly after the Second World War, where he simply said, where are they? And the way he put the question is not quite the way we put the question today. But in essence, we're saying, why isn't there any evidence for extraterrestrials? And there's a chap called Stephen Webb who's written a very nice book, giving about 70 different explanations of the Fermi paradox. And you can say, yes, that civilization destroys itself. This one goes into runaway global warming and so on and so forth. But all of them. So something doesn't seem to add up big time there and it could simply be that you know uh, we haven't looked hard enough after all searching for signals has only been going on for a short time but in point of fact there are various lines of evidence to suggest that in fact first of all to colonize a galaxy geologically doesn't take that long as civilizations grow so we assume they need to harvest more and more energy and so eventually they surround their stars so that most of the solar energy is absorbed by the civilization and it's re-radiated as waste heat. That's called infrared radiation. And indeed, there have been searches of stars and indeed whole galaxies to see whether there is any evidence of an extremely advanced technology, the so-called Dyson sphere. And so far, nothing, nothing at all. And in these cases, you can look at a very large number of stars and a very large number of galaxies. 
So all the time, the evidence seems to be pointing towards some problem. The Fermi paradox seems to hold. So what's going on? I don't know, of course. Um, and then, as you say, there are all these other strange reports. And this is really into fringe science. And there's a remarkable film from the US Navy of these objects zooming around and doing physically impossible things. And these are called unidentified flying vehicles or unidentified flying objects, whatever you want to call them. And the US Navy, uh, the people who work in the cockpit are generally not given to imagination. I've met quite a few pilots and, uh, you know, they have one business and that is staying alive at very high speeds. So my sense is that actually it's all part of this larger story and I can't to articulate it any better than that. It goes back to this question of consciousness. It goes back to the nature of the universe we really find ourselves in. And some years ago, I published a short paper on the Fermi paradox and um, its title, the short title was um, Three Explanations for Extraterrestrials. Sensible, unlikely, mad. And sensible is, yes, we're going to find them one day. Unlikely is we're alone. And mad, you can guess which one I went for. It is, once again, that I don't think the things those US Navy pilots saw were extraterrestrial vehicles in the sense that they were visitors from another planet. But there they are on film, footage released by the Pentagon, racing around all over the place with impossible accelerations. Um, and all it tells me is, and I'd be interested to know what Rupert Sheldrake thought of these, for example. But my guess would be he'd say at the very least, we're going to keep an open mind here. Interestingly, you spoke about uh, Charlie Line Weaver. I am quite familiar with his work, and I think he had written something about the biological overview effect where he had spoken about what happens to astronauts once they get out into space and what is also called uh, popularly as the overview effect. Now, where, what he was trying to describe there, I guess, and what I'm trying to connect to what you just said is, if it is a hypothesis, then why is it difficult for us to also accept the other side? Why could we not be the first? And let ourselves hypothesize a little more. Let's just look at some more interesting stuff, what could happen. Because as you travel out of space, where Carl Sagan said, it's, we are a small blue dot. Mm -hmm. And the moment we start looking at ourselves as a small blue dot because of space travel, <laughs> funnily, we, we assume or we think that there could be somebody else looking at us, but maybe not. You do not have to create the other hypothesis like we do in physics with parallel worlds. Yep, it, it is indeed. And I have colleagues who take that sort of parallel worlds very seriously. And I, I'm not a physicist, but... I, see, I, I think I understand their logic, and, and logic is not something to be dismissed lightly. Um, you know, if, if, if aspects of uh, quantum physics point that way, then, you know, we need to take them seriously. Uh, but I, I, again, I'm skeptical. Uh, and uh, your, I mean, your general point, I mean, first of all, we could be the first. Um, and as a chap I've not met myself, but you probably know his writing because I, I'm realizing with, with growing a, a growing alarm that you've read much more than I have, which is great. Uh, they're called Nick Bostrom. And he's got very, so he, he, he's one of the things he's interested in is whether in fact we, we are live in a um, virtual universe and various people have explored this. And uh, I, I think for various reasons, it's unlikely, but it's not impossible. Um, but one of the other things he points out is a, a very amusing short article. I think I mentioned it in my book, actually, is that, um, you know, if, if we if we find evidence for even primitive in life, even primitive life on Mars, we should be seriously worried. And if we found something as if we find something as advanced as a trilobite, we should panic. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this sounds sort of, you know, what on earth is he talking about? What he's saying is that given the fact that there are all these other solar systems which have formed many billions of years before our one and if indeed they had their own Burgess shale and their own Cambrian explosion and their own evolution of mammals and all the rest of it and something like ourselves as I mentioned then um, once again we shouldn't be here that there are other people ahead of us 
And as he says, ironically, in, in, in this article, he says, nothing, li I, I paraphrase, I don't quote exactly, nothing lifts my heart more than lifeless sands and endless dunes. Um, so, you know, if everything else is as dead as a doornail, we, 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 we really are the first on the block. Though that doesn't make a lot of sense from the point of view of the history of star formation or planetary formation. And then, as you say, you mention the question of time. And as you say, so far as time is concerned, from a physical viewpoint, it's, it's completely symmetrical. You know, it doesn't make any difference. And again, this gets us into very deep water, far beyond my competence. But of course, there are people who suggested and sense that. And I think there may be an echo of this in some of the Indian religions as well. Perhaps correct me immediately if I've misunderstood this, that in one sense, time is an illusion. In other words, it is how, how we perceive it. You know, and we, we, we get up in the morning and we fall asleep at night and all the rest of it. But in point of fact, there is something which is more analogous to sort of a timeline where all we're doing is traveling along this worm of time from our birth to our extinction. And some people, of course, would argue that then we join another timeline and then they would subscribe to various ideas about reincarnation, which again, is something which is a metaphysical question and we're not going to go in there uh, not because i'm not interested in it but simply because i don't know enough about it so once again i would agree with you that there are these aspects about the world around us and not least is that okay we we know time in a sense but of course it's got this maddening elusiveness about it but so far as biology is concerned as i mentioned quite a bit of time ago we alone, I would suggest, know that we've got a history and that history matters to us very much indeed, even though we can't do anything about it. But also we can imagine counterfactual alternatives in the future. And I think once again, despite anything else, it's that power of imagination, this power to think outside the box, um, which is, if you like, a sort of hopeful sign. That's, don't know, that, the, that, that these aren't simply just illusions. These aren't simply fairy tales. But these are actually central to us being human. Very true. And you did touch upon the illusion part of the Indian tradition. And it's actually called Maya. The fundamental concept there does come from Advanta uh, Vedanta, which is a school devoted to Vedanta. And it originally denotes that a cosmic illusion and the phenomenal world but that that's a, a concept where which is also interesting and if you look at analytical idealism for example something that bernardo castro talks about a lot mm -hmm. is are we actually has evolution tuned us to see reality as reality is and maybe not because reality as we see it may not have been safe for us to survive and he uses a great analogy of a aircraft cockpit where what we see are results of a dial in the cockpit but not mm -hmm. the actual reality out there interesting since we've got there now do you think that evolution has tuned us with our senses and when we talk about senses i do know that a, a lot of us say five senses but i think technically now we probably have somewhere around 18 to 19 senses, though generally we talk about five. Do we actually perceive reality as is out there? Well, I think, again, my colleague visiting with me at the moment has, has, is, is very interested in, in philosophical ideas, which briefly suggest that although, of course, we sense things and you say we think traditionally of the five senses, in point of fact, and this is going against some aspects of Western tradition, which I believe go back to the time of Kant and so forth. Um, uh, the materialist would simply say what we sense is what is, whereas there are views which in a way suggest that we formulate the ideas and they may well be informed by sensory perception, but they're not governed by them. And you might say, well, hang on a moment, that's ridiculous. You know, you've got to be able to see. And if you're not, then we can help you as you're blind and so on and so forth. But um, the, the, the point there, I think, is that in a very small way, science itself allows one to see from very, very strange perspectives indeed. Very odd perspectives and correspondingly uh, 
it's not so much that um, one is governed by merely one's material existence, but it is, and this is why language is so important and why philosophy is essential, but of course, far, as we say in my country, far beyond my pay scale. And you think of philosophers like Heidegger and many people have got a lot more time for Wittgenstein. And again, they're pretty well closed books to me, but my understanding is that they are wrestling with what in English we would call the ineluctable. But the net result of all these discussions is, again, in contrast to animals which just live their humdrum lives because that's what they're intended to do, is that um, we have this endless curiosity and thirst to, to know things. And as often as not, we articulate them in a very imperfect fashion. And indeed, I don't doubt that there are cultures where these things can flourish. And I also have good reason to think there are cultures which do their best to suppress this sort of free thinking. And that was ever the way. So it's very difficult to, to answer your question more coherently than that, I'm afraid, uh, other than um, almost to repeat myself, that one has an aspect of imaginative powers here where, in a way, I'm told, again, I, I merely paraphrase what I once read in a biography, is, and I, I don't subscribe directly to the genius theory of history, but I have certainly met a number of people who are just terrifyingly intelligent. Um, and Einstein, I believe was the case, is he, he, he believed very strongly in thought experiments. Just suppose, and I think one of his main early thought experiments, he, he just said, and I hope I paraphrase this correctly, supposing I was a photon, then, you know, what would it be like? And as soon as you put yourself from that perspective, and I, don't ask me to unpack that any further. Then he works towards areas which actually I was once told in terms of general relativity, um, Isaac Newton was not so far away from, you know, it's a, and of course, Isaac Newton, which is almost in parenthesis, is celebrated, especially in Cambridge, as one of the most remarkable physicists of all time, but much less well known is he spent an enormous amount of time, more of his time, on the study of the Bible and on metaphysics. And he was in many ways a sort, a sort of mystic. And this is rather sort of pushed under the carpet by people who just want to celebrate him as the great scientist, which he was, but he was other things as well. Right, and definitely Newton probably spent the last 15 to 20 years of his life not working on anything to do with gravity, but he was mm. he was looking at other metaphysical experiments. After the 15th century or the 16th century, somewhere with Descartes, where we spoke about dualism. Mm. I, I agree. And, and yes, I, 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 think, I think that people are grappling to find more holistic views because the endless reductionism of science is extremely powerful. But when you look around you, I mean, when I look at the majority of papers, with great respect, they're often very well conducted, but they're just another experiment. They're working in existing paradigms, and that's absolutely fine. I have no quarrel with that. We all have to work in some sort of framework. But as you say, there's this intuition, which, of course, is being made clear by the physicists for a long time, that you can't discount the observer. And even in a very small way, when we talk about animal minds, of course, it's only us who are interested in the mind of the animal. It's not the other way around at all. They, they couldn't care less. And I, I use one sort of example where, you know, they were trying to train rhesus monkeys to do something. And they spent a whole year. And in the end, the rhesus monkeys still didn't get it. And that tells me something very important. Not that rhesus monkeys are stupid. They're not. But they're, they, they, they're, they're just not. It's nothing to do with them this particular experiment, but it tells us something very interesting about ourselves, that what other species would bother us many a year trying to find out that a rhesus monkey couldn't do something. So it is this question of us, the observer, and the fact that although we attempt to be objective, we live in a world of meaning and interpretation and imagination. And if we neglect or ignore those, we lose something central to being human. Simon, before we let you go, we do know that we have kept you here and I want to sincerely thank you for the time you've spent with us. You've been very generous, both with your time and ideas and thoughts that you've shared with us here. It's been an absolute 
pleasure talking to you. I'm trying not to look at the watch because every <laughs> time I look at the watch, I feel guilty for holding you longer. So, I'm, worry, I'm, so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to ask another question. And because <laughs> this is on audio and not video, I'm trying to get from the tone of your voice, whether are you pushing him too much, you should be stopping now. But most of our listeners are young students. What would you tell them and what would your advice be? Um, well, uh, I, I was very lucky in the way that I was brought up. I, I had parents who were um, very supportive in many ways. And obviously, one knows that some families are and some aren't. So, you know, that's nothing, nothing to do with me. I, I mean, briefly, what I would really say, so far as I can be helpful, is first of all, keep your mind open. Um, obviously, you must learn things and, and, and you've got to learn a great deal. And you shouldn't be embarrassed that it's hard work. It is. I know. Um, but uh, that, and the, but the, sec the second thing I is that you should just read as much as you possibly can. And I won't rant on here, but as you gather from the trouble trying to get connected earlier, uh, I, I don't have a mobile phone, for example. Uh, I have an iPad I use very occasionally, and I have to use a computer, of course. But try and avoid, so far as you can, um, you know, uh, the, the standard ways of accessing information. Try and read, read, read. You can read online, of course you can, that doesn't matter. But try and read, and not only read in the area you're fascinated in, but also try and read as widely as you possibly can, at least so far as traditions in India are by no means identical to this country, but it's a great deal of overlap, I know. Um, try and read stories of imagination. I mean, I'm, this is a whole set of another ideas, but uh, we mentioned Owen Barfield, and he, of course, was one of a group of uh, philosophers and Christians in Oxford called the Inklings, and uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien are, for me, uh, titanic figures. Uh, they may not resonate with many of your readers but and listeners, um, but correspondingly, as I mentioned also in passing, um, I've got to enjoy reading ghost stories enormously, uh, and we could go into that discussion of do ghosts exist, discuss, discuss, um, but irrespective of whether they do or not, they open one's imagination, and that I think is the most important thing. And it doesn't have to be that. It can, it, for other people it would be music, and for other people it would be their poetry, and for other people, it would be simply taking time to talk to other people. It's not, there's nothing magic about any of these things, but that, that would be my, my suggestion. Keep your imagination open and read as much as you possibly can about everything you can lay your hands on. Absolutely, and you did mention J.R.R. Tolkien, and he's a big name here, and definitely Lord of the Rings is as popular, probably more popular than it is there. You'll be surprised to know that. I'm delighted to hear that. That's <laughs> great. So, Thank you once again, Simon. It's been an absolute pleasure. We do hope you've enjoyed your time with us as well. And uh, I'm going to say, I just hope we can talk to you again. Thank you very much. This Hub Hopper original ko sunne ke liye aapka shukriya. Agar aap bhi apna podcast launch karna chahte hain, to Hub Hopper Studio website pe register karein aur ek minute ke andar andar apna khud ka podcast launch karein. Yahi nahi, Studio deta hai aapko puri azadi kahi bhi, kabhi bhi apna podcast launch karne ki sirf teen aasan steps mein. To saath mein apna podcast shuru karne ke liye taiyar. Just hop on. Hub Hopper, simply content.